the only perfect one. Power, love, purity personified. For He is Trinity, all three, holy, holy, holy. All His creatures, let His song Greetings in the name of our merciful Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My name is Megan and I serve in the music ministry. Thank you for joining us for praise and worship. Everyone is invited to join us at the online fellowship center. Let's spend some time to catch up with one another. Prayer ministers will be available for our prayer needs. To sign in, Please scan the QR code on your screen. The Kingdom Kids Ministry serves children from toddlers to grade 6. To join the Zoom Day classes and to receive weekly Sunday school lessons, please scan the QR code. For more info, please email children at unionchurch.ph. The Youth Ministry invites students in grades 7 to 12 to join the online service and fellowship. For updates, like the Disciples of Christ United on Facebook. Pastor Chad offers a midweek reflection as a resource to the current sermon series regarding UCM every Wednesday on the Union Church of Manila YouTube channel and Facebook page. Join the Kingdom Women Fellowship, where women of all ages are invited to a time of inspirational biblical teaching and enriching discussions with the hopes of deepening their faith and bonding with one another. Kingdom Women will meet every second Saturday, beginning February 12. If you haven't registered, please scan the QR code or email the address on your screen. Come for a time of missional prayer on February 17. Our prayer focus this, for this month is Yemen. Lasting missionary work is done on our knees. To join, please scan the QR code. The UCM Library services will resume this Sunday, January 30. To know more, please visit the library website. Are you passionate about getting people plugged in? The Volunteer Committee is looking for new members, regular UCM attendees who want to help build up the body of Christ by meeting and encouraging aspiring volunteers, faithfully plugging them in, and empowering the ministries that receive them. Please scan the QR code for more details. Our giving blesses those in need and provides others an opportunity to know Christ. To fill out a pledge card, please scan the QR code. Details about giving are in your bulletin and on the website. Thank you. Keep safe and God bless. Well, welcome everyone tuning in now for the service of worship and celebration of the Lord Jesus Christ. A particular warm greeting to you if you're joining us for the first time. We are pleased that you found Union Church of Manila to worship, and we are really pleased that you can worship with us today. Uh, a few things to mention by way of announcement. It is this, this is the Sunday that in Union Church we recognize uh, Chinese New Year, so I would like to greet everyone with a Xin Yin Kuai Le. Happy New Year, and traditionally in Union Church, as many know, we would have food and festivity on this occasion, uh, so we look forward to a day when we able be able to resume that festivity on Chinese New Year. So happy Chinese New Year to many. Uh, wanna let you know also that next Sunday, not today, but the following Sunday is our communion Sunday. So I want to invite everyone to go ahead and uh, prepare and plan to prepare bread and cup that we may celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper together on that day. Thirdly, wanna mention to all of the small groups who are meeting right now in Union Church, or if you're not meeting as a small group and you would like to form a small group or just get a couple people together to discuss, 
As you know, as Pastor Chad has been um, explaining, we are going through our values, our, our vision statements for Union Church of Manila over the next six months. And we are encouraging all of Union Church of Manila to take up going through the small group discussion questions that have been prepared each week. There is also a supplemental midweek resource in the way of a video that we're encouraging everyone to interact with. So if you are in a small group or you're thinking about forming a small group, could I encourage you to, fought, to take up these questions and discuss these following the message, following the scripture that we are giving each Sunday. Our, our objective and our heart and, and what we're trying to do is embed the values in and through the congregation of Union Church over the next six months, that we may be aligned in the revealed uh, vision that God is giving us going ahead in this year. And if you are already undertaking a course of study in your group, could we even ask you to pause and to resume that study later or to somehow work in these discussion questions in addition to whatever you are doing? So please be encouraged. It's an exciting time in the world in addition to what is going on, I believe, in, what, in terms of what God is doing in Union Church of Manila. So please let us know if we can assist. Those questions are found on Facebook and the supplemental video is there on Facebook. They'll be there each week. And if you are an active group leader already, you're supposed to be getting those on email. Let us know if we can get those to you. Uh, a pastoral note to the congregation. Uh, as many know, Louis Torrente uh, passed away recently. And now we are going to have his memorial service uh, on January 30th. And that's going to be at 3 p.m. online. Also, this week... Um, we lost another member, longtime member of the congregation in Conrago, Conrado Nigidula. Uh, he passed away this week. He was 100 years old and a longtime member of the church, served in many ways over those years, very beloved member of the church. We're going to host his memorial service on February 6th, and that is going to be at 2 p.m. So we, we ask that you continue to... Um, Keep these families and, and add, now add the Nigidula family into your prayers going forward as we remember the lives of these faithful men and give thanks for their lives. Thank you. Now let us prepare for worship together as a community of faith. Come, let us gather together in unity to exalt the Lord. He is the light of the world. He is worthy to be praised. And the congregation replied, We gather as the church to lift our hearts and our voices to exalt the Lord. He alone is worthy to be praised. Let us pause and prepare our hearts to exalt the Lord. Lord, you are alone worthy to be praised. Would you help us in this time to exalt you? Would you prepare us for, to go further, to go deeper, to go higher as we sing songs and hymns of praise and thanksgiving? As we hear your word expounded, may we hear and see what it is you may want us to receive in this time. You are so worthy, Lord. We worship you now. Help us to do it wholeheartedly with our full attention on you together. We love you. We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. In celebration of Chinese New Year and to mark the international diversity of Union Church of Manila, I will be reading today's scripture in Chinese Cantonese. Please follow along in English on the screen. Today's scripture reading is taken from 1 John Chapter 4, verses 7 to 12. Verse 7. 亲爱的,我们要彼此相爱,因为爱是从上帝来的。凡有爱的,都是由上帝而生,并且认识上帝。Verse 8. 
。由此，上帝对我们的爱就显明了。Verse ten， 不是我们爱上帝，而是上帝爱我们，差他的儿子为我们的罪得了作了赎罪祭，这就是爱。Verse eleven， 亲爱的，既然上帝这样爱我们。我们也要彼此相爱。Verse t w 从来没有人见过上帝。我们若彼此相爱，上帝就住在我们里面，他的爱在我们里面得以圆满了。This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, you love us and sent your one and only begotten Son Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins. That is your steadfast love. This is the amazing gospel of grace and our true hope. Two years of COVID plus the recent surge continue to shake us with uncertainties globally. Even with COVID, even without COVID, illnesses, violences, natural calamities, political conflicts, economic turmoils, and religious persecutions persist. All these remind us that we are all sinners living in a fallen world. That adversities and death are inevitable. The Bible says, "All have seen and fall short glory of the fall short of the glory of God." The wages of sin is death, and judgment awaits us. It is a taboo to mention death in Chinese culture, especially during New Year. Yet we cannot thank you enough for the eternal life in Christ crucified, for the forgiveness of sins for those who believe. We remember our late brother Louis Toronto. May your peace and comfort be upon his family. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. O、oh、Father, have mercy on us sinners. Open our eyes to walk by faith and not by sight, so we can focus on the ultimate kingdom of God. Open our ears so we can hear the good news again and again. Renew our minds with your word to know you and live for you and not for ourselves. Keep our hearts burning with the desire to serve you, and with compassion to share the gospel truth with, to reconcile repentant sinners to you through faith. May death be not just a reminder of the brevity of life, but in light of the gospel, becomes an invitation to know Jesus. And live a repentant, abundant life in Christ. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. The power and the glory for ever, Amen. Let's affirm our faith together by reciting the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and of all things seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from Light, True God from True God, begotten not made. One in being with the Father, through Him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, He was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, He rose again in fulfillment of the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the Giver of Life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, He is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Hello, my name is Rico Del Rosario. I am Filipino and I help out in the Kingdom Kids Ministry. Hello, I am Liza Lau. I am Filipino and I serve in the Children's Ministry and the Missions and Benevolence Ministry. Hi, we're the Morales family. My name is Jesse. We're actually a Filipino-American family from the state of Hawaii. In UCM, I'm involved in the Sunday School teaching of fifth graders. I'm Aima. I'm partnering with Jesse in teaching the fifth graders called the Cliffhangers in the Children's Ministry of UCM. Hello, I'm Japheth and I am currently part of the Young Adults Ministry. And I'm Jaden and I'm a part of the Youth Ministry. What I love about UCM is that it is a home away from home, a second home for anyone in Christ's family. Our family has been attending UCM since 2006. I was around four then and by now I'm 19. So what I really love about UCM is that they were part of my life every step of the way. I was in Sunday school and then I was in youth and now I'm in young adults. Though a close second to that would be the library. I hung around there a lot before the pandemic started. What I love about Union Church, the people, um, whenever I'm with UCMers, I'm just surrounded with people who love God and love food in that order. They love God first and then food. And of course, we love each other. That's, that's a great thing about Union Church. And what I love about UCM is it's interdenominational. Jesus is preached in the sermons and Jesus is part of every program and activities of UCM. Yeah, it's really Christ-centered, so it doesn't matter if you're Methodist, Baptist, or Pentecostal, or Lutheran. Everyone is welcome in this church. It's really a, a, a union church. Our small group has been part in our lives, you know, in every challenge, in every victory. The other year, we experienced Ulysses. Our house got flooded, and our group mates, our small group mates, you know, was there to help us in the cleanup. I'm thankful that the love of Christ has been shown mm -hmm. through that. And I love the spiritual support, especially in prayer. In the church, there is a prayer chain that really keeps an eye on members and make sure that they are supported spiritually through prayers. Before we started going to Union Church, I had given up on Christianity. I had given up on the church. My faith was hanging by a thread. I was ready to give up on Jesus. We were badly hurt by Christians and, and that pretty much cost my turning away. After several years of, of not praying, not reading my Bible, not having anything to do with Christianity. My wife came up to me and said, please, I, I really miss going to church. I miss worship. And so I said, okay, um, we'll list down three churches that I heard were good. The first in the list was Union Church. After the service, we went down to pick up our daughter, Dana, from, from uh, Kingdom Kids. Um, Teacher Annalise came up to us and said, Oh, um, Dana told us during Sunday school that tomorrow you'll be going on a trip to Hong Kong. And, and um, can I please pray for you? But before even getting our permission, she just launched into the prayer and she prayed for our trip that our family would have a great time in Hong Kong for safety, for great weather, and you know. And while she was praying, the Lord was speaking to my heart and, and I was like, okay, God, I mean, I turned my back on you because I got hurt by Christians and here you are using Christians to draw me back to faith. It's, it's really been wonderful how God just gathered us back to him after that first Sunday in Union Church and now we are you know, getting more united, more centered, more mature in our faith in Jesus. Join us in UCM. Join us. Together we will learn about God's love for us and His plan for us um, in scriptures. It will be the ride of your life. 
and you know you, you must have your own story your own background uh, wherever you come from Jesus knows all of that and and I hope that when you come and join us in Union Church that you will find something of what I found a community of Christians who are so passionate about Jesus and are so loving to each other Tayo ay nagkakaisa kay Kristo Or as we say it in Cebuano Nakaiusap kita Dihak kang Kristo Estamos unidos en Kristo we are united in Christ. We are united in Christ. We are united in Christ. We are UCM. We are UCM. We are UCM. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're tuning in across the globe and whenever you're tuning in. Uh, we're, again, delighted that you have come to uh, worship with us, to pray with us, to uh, sing with us, to exalt Christ with us in our time together. And, uh, and this time especially is to study what God would have for us as a community of faith. And we are in our last week of study on our first value. We're going through the values of UCM, uh, Union Church of Manila, and we have a total of five of them. And, and we finished the first one uh, this week. It's called The Value of Being United in Christ. And so uh, as we've been going through this series, I, I just want to make you aware again of our midweek study that we have. That comes out on Wednesday, and you can tune in. It's supplemental to the Sunday study. It's generally anywhere between five and eight minutes long. And, and also, if you are a part of an SDG group, we are again encouraging you to follow that, that video and to follow the study guide that aligns to these values. What we're trying to do is really embed these values that we think are so biblical and so fundamental to the church. We are, we're really trying to embed them into the ethos, the life and the character and, and just the personality of Union Church of Manila as we strive to become more like Christ. So uh, we would encourage you to jump in and look at some of those things. Today, let me just uh, finish by reading our final uh, this one last time, our, our first value here, which is united in Christ. If you're, if you're tuning in with me, please just read it aloud. Use your uh, uh, inside voice and uh, uh, follow along with me. This is our, our value of being united in Christ. It says that we are an international community from diverse backgrounds, cultures, denominations, bound together by our common commitment to exalt the person and work of Jesus Christ. May it be so. Let's pray. Lord, we come today desiring to be what you want us to be as a church. Union Church of Manila, we exist to exalt you, Lord. And, and, and we pray that as we go through this time together and we think about being united in Christ, Lord, that you would minister to each of us, that even in this moment, you would be shaping our character, shaping our, our, our personality, shaping who we are as, and how we represent you to this world. So today, as we finish that, Value number one, I pray that you would minister to us and even challenge us with what we see about your church in the scripture. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Well, many years ago, I, I learned a lot about myself. I, I used to be um, a, a kindergarten teacher. And, and as I worked as a kindergarten teacher to immigrant students and from immigrant families, I, I learned a lot about myself and life and ministry and people. At, at the time, I, I wasn't too excited about having to take on this role as we were planting a church. But as I look back in retrospect, I realize how much this time shaped me and, 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 and how I learned in this season of life. Reminds me now of that widely proliferated wisdom of Robert Fulgham, who, who wrote that, that piece that so many people know so well, all I ever needed to know. I learned in kindergarten, maybe you've read that, and, and there's tremendous truth to that. See, much of the learning that takes place in kindergarten is learning about how we interact 
with others and how we play nicely with the people around us. See, when those young students would come into my class, we, we knew that they would be in school for many years. And, and part of my responsibility for these entering young students was to teach them how to cooperate and how to function in healthy relationships with people around them. They would need to know that, not just for school, but for the rest of life. So especially in the first few weeks, as kindergarten teachers, we worked on classroom management and expectations, particularly in how we relate to other people. Even throughout the whole year, I would focus on three areas that I would talk to my students about daily. Attitude, actions, and word. Attitude, that, uh, uh, th- this concept, I would, you know, we would set them down around the table with a guitar and sing songs. And then we would say, now always think of others. Don't be selfish. Respect others and their space. Care for others Then actions, things like you you need to play nice with other people. You need to learn to share with one another. Never hit anyone. Always give handshakes, hugs, and high fives. Always be helpful. And then we would use emphasize words and say only nice things. Don't ever make fun of others. Always use your inside voice. Don't say bad words. And and we spent a great deal of time developing attitude, actions, and words. Developing how we needed to interact with one another in community, which is incredibly important in the formative years of being a kindergartner. Now, why do I say that? Because as I look through the pages of scriptures, I see the New Testament authors take a very similar approach to their instructions to the church. I guess apparently somewhere along the way, we lose sight of these principles that we are taught in kindergarten, these community principles, and we need refresher courses. Because long before I was teaching the attitude, action, and word principles to children, the apostles, the disciples, and even the Son of God were teaching those principles to the church into the body of Christ and extra instructing the ecclesia or the gathering when the people come together and we gather together and we interact with one another. It, it, the, Jesus and the apostles and the scriptures are teaching us how we need to be in relationship with one another and how we need to rub up against one another and how we remain united in our diversity. And it's very clear that the scripture provides boundaries and expectations and specific guidelines on how we ought to engage with others around us in the body of Christ. In fact, if you were to read the New Testament and take out a highlighter and every time you saw the word phrase, one another. It's a phrase that literally emphasizes our, or the nature of our interaction, the, 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 the frequency of our interaction. And, and you were to take a highlighter and, you know, turn the pages, uh, one another, one another, one another. If you were to highlight all those one another phrases, you would certainly use up a good measure of ink. Because you will find one another used 59 times in the New Testament. And then, and, and then there's phrases around it that further describe what our un- another, one another behavior should be like. See, these occurrences are where the writers are instructing the church on how they ought to live in community and how they ought to be in relationship with other people in the church. See, in our series up to this point, as we talk about being united in Christ, our first week, we talked about uh, keeping Christ at the center. And secondly, we talked about keeping the unity in the midst of diversity. And, and last week, we talked about keeping the peace when we are at odds with one another. But this being our final week on this value, I want to s- discuss uh, this idea of keeping a one another mentality. I didn't know how better to describe it. Because the the Bible gives us 59 times that says, church, be one another people. 
It's highlighted so often in scripture. And if we are going to remain a, a, a people that is united in Christ, the Bible goes through great length to teach us that we must cultivate this one another outlook that will shape our norms and shape our practices and shape our ethos. I believe the Bible teaches us that the one another sort of way of life is the glue that maintains our unity in the body of Christ. Now, if there are 59 one another texts, there are no way that I could cover all 59 adequately on a Sunday morning. We would be here all afternoon. I would need a two-month sermon series to talk about all 59 of them and how to apply them on individual basis. By the way, I've included them in, in the bulletin handout. I've included them in the SDG material for study this week. And if you're following the series in the SDG group, I am asking you to read all 59 of them in one sitting because it's a powerful thing when you do. But listen, you can't even possibly study all of them uh, in depth in the amount of time that you have in your SDGs this week. So what have I done? I have discovered, in fact, that these 59 one another's, although we can't study them individually, they can be placed in three general categories. Can you guess what general categories I'm going to use? It goes all the way back to my kindergarten days. They fit into attitudes, one another attitudes, one another actions, and one another words. See, the scripture teaches us that if we are going to strive To remain united in Christ, we need to be self-aware and we need to regularly examine our attitudes, our actions, and our language as we interact with other believers. That when these are out of alignment with Christ's vision for our church, the divisions that we discussed last week begin to creep in and, and stain our community of faith. So, First, first, let us examine the first one another uh, uh, that we, we've listed here, the, the, uh, the one another attitudes that we should have. You, you know, the, the New Testament, when, when we start thinking of one another attitudes, the most common New Testament word for our attitude when it talks about one another is love one another. In fact, you will see 13 love one another specifically, and then On top of that, there are multiple variations of that. And things like love one another deeply, love one another in a way that your love overflows, love one another with great affection. And so you keep adding those up and you have so many times that the Bible says as we interact with one another that we are to love one another. In fact, the love one another takes up most of the places on the 59, uh, the list of 59. But there are other attitudes, and I want you to read them with me. Uh, Let's just go down. There's a few of them that I want you to read with me when it comes to attitude. You read it there. I'll read it here. We'll read it aloud. So, love one another. Be at peace with each other. Have equal concern for each other. Don't judge one another. Be patient with one another. Be humble with one another. Be compassionate with one another. Be devoted to one another. And if you notice these, many of these have the B word in front of them. You know, be loving with one another. Be peace with one another. It is a disposition of how we ought to be in ourselves and in our attitudes. And in these commands, the writers of scriptures are asking believers to really look inside of themselves and to examine their hearts and motivations that they have towards others in the body of Christ. In other words, they are indirectly asking, are you, are you walking in an attitude of love? Are you walking in an attitude of peace? Are you walking in humility? Are you walking in an attitude of concern for other people? Because if you're not, you're not bringing the right attitude into the body of Christ. 
Go, if you remember the great love chapter that Paul talks about immediately after the body of Christ illustration. Remember the second week of our our sermon series here, we talked about the body of Christ and we focused in on 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It was this place where the body was quarreling. It was where where people had their own ideas, competing uh, ideas and priorities. They were trying to place their own, uh, the importance of their own gifts above others, their own desires, their, their own priorities. And they, re- remember they were in chapter 11, even fighting over the Lord's table. Re- remember all that di- division? And then Paul comes in with this body metaphor that he uses. He says, you're all one part of the body and, and you need to work together. And, and he reminds them that they are united in that. But then at the end of that chapter where he's talking about the body, he says this in, in chapter 12, verse 31, he says, and, and now uh, eagerly desire the higher gifts. And, and look at this phrase, and I will show you still a more excellent way. Now, now what does all this mean, Pastor Chad? You know, what what are we talking about here? He says, you know, you all have been arguing about spiritual stuff. (laughs) You've been arguing about biblical stuff. You've been arguing about church stuff. You've been arguing about personal stuff. You've been arguing about personal and different approaches to the church. But now let me talk about the best stuff, the most excellent way for the body of Christ It's not in this division, but he launches into a chapter that deals with our attitudes towards one another. He launches into the chapter on love. And look at what the text says. He goes, now here's the most excellent way. And he says, if I speak with the tongue of men and angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Look at this person right here, you know? He, he's got tongues, he's got all the gifts, he's got all the talent. He is super Christian. He can speak in tongues. He, he can prophesy incredible prophetic powers. He can understand deep mysteries because he understands the mysteries of God. He has the knowledge, all depths of knowledge. He has tremendous faith that he can even move mountains. You know, I think of he's a, you know, like super Christian, can move tall mountains in a single prayer. You know, he is this kind of person. She is this kind of believer. This believer has everything. You want to talk about as spiritual as you can get. And while he or she has all these gifts and all these abilities have been given so many talents and what they can do is mind-blowing, Paul says, you know, you can do all that, but if your attitude's not right, all of that that you've just done is just noise. It's a clanging gong. Because there is not a one another attitude, an attitude of love that accompanies it. There is not an attitude that is genuinely considering the people around you. And if you don't have that, then you really have nothing. You're just noise. And then he even goes on further and he, and then he talks about what this attitude of love should look like. Practically speaking, you know the chapter. It's a, one of the most famous chapters in the Bible. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Now, if you were here a few years ago, I taught through, this was my first sermon series I taught at Union Church of Manila, going through the love chapter. I thought as we're coming into, you know, the body of Christ and and talking about how to be a church, that this was an important piece because of this element of love and unity that needs to exist in the body of Christ. And, and, And if you were there three years ago, you know that I don't see this text as that sort of nice flowery text that we make it, you know, you hang it on your wall and put it everywhere. Love is patient. Love is kind. To me, this is one of the most challenging and convicting texts in all of scripture. And I think Paul wrote it as such 
to convict a very divided congregation, to convict a dysfunctional church, and he's trying to bring them back into alignment. Because listen, when I put my name into this, and I made everybody in our church do this, Chad is patient, Chad is kind, Chad does not envy, Chad does not boast. I go on and on, and with each one of those phrases, I become more convicted because I see that my attitude of love doesn't align with what God would envision my attitude to be in the body of Christ. And I see that I need a frequent attitudes adjustments with how I interact with others in the body of Christ, or even my thoughts about the body of Christ. Let me ask you, beloved, when you put your name in here, you know, Ralph is patient. Ralph is kind. Sarah does not envy. Sarah does not boast. You put your name in there. How does it, how does it sound? What do you discover? D does it sound okay? Does it fit? Does it work for you? It's a very convicting text, and that was Paul's intention. See, if we are going to be united in Christ, we need to continually examine our attitudes and ask Christ to align them with his. And, and I encourage you to go through not only 1 Corinthians chapter 13, but, but go through those 59 one another texts in your time with the Lord this week and, and ask him, Lord, you know, as you look at me and as I examine myself and I survey the landscape of my life, Lord, today, am I humble? Am I proud? Am I loving? How am I interacting? What are my attitudes to the body of Christ that need to realign with what you would have for me? Because I don't want to bring harm to the body of Christ. I want to be like you. I don't want to bring wrong attitudes into the church. That's the point of the love chapter is Paul is saying realign your values to the values of Christ to align them to Christ instead of the quarreling that you have and the dysfunction and the disunity. If you align to the love, if you align with the right attitude, Attitude, that is going to be the shaping, the formative shaping and the glue that creates the unity. See, I believe the Lord delights when his children are, are, are willing to examine their own attitudes out of their love for them and say, Lord, search my heart. And aren't you glad that the Lord, out of his attitude of love and humility and graciousness, his attitude of patience gently forgives us when we come to him in this posture of, Lord, make me like you. And then he, he, he takes us and helps us with his power to transform us to become more like him. I put number one, if you're, if you're following along in your notes today, if we're going to be united in Christ, if, if we at UCM are going to be united in Christ, we need to constantly check our attitudes. And, and listen, I, it doesn't matter if you've been here one Sunday or if you've been here your whole life. We need to always be examining our attitudes to see if they align with the biblical attitudes that are put in this sort of one another mentality. We need to check ourselves regularly and check our attitudes. Now, the second classification of one another's that the Bible deals with has to do with our one another actions or our one another activities. Let's go back to our list, if we would. I, 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 I put them right here. Again, can we, can we read them together aloud where you're at? And so here, here is action. So serve one another, encourage one another, wash one another's feet carry one another's burdens, forgive one another, be hospitable to one another, kiss one another, not in a, a romantic or a, in a kind of way, but demonstrating a family-like kinship kind of relationship because you, you, you love others in the body of Christ so deeply. Now, if you take a look at these, these are examples that teach us what our movements should be, and what we should do when we see the believers around us. And, 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 and that should include activity that is done out of my person for another person. Listen, if I am surveying the landscape of my life, and all of my activity serves 
my pleasure and my gain and my delight and, and, and my pre, uh, preferences and, and, and for my good. And I cannot point to activity or movement from my life directly from me that exists or move for the sake of others to serve others, then I can say with some certainty that I don't have a one another life that has been described in scripture for members of the body of Christ. <laughs> you know, several years ago, I was uh, at a Christian camp and we were uh, taking uh, limbs that were cut down and we were putting them in a wood chopper all day long. I, I tell you what, it was hot, it was summertime, it was a sweaty, dirty job, and as you sweat, the, 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 the chips or the dust from the wood gets stuck on you, and you just become completely covered in grime. It is, it is, it is a challenging, brutal job. Nobody wanted to be there. Nobody wanted to do it, but it needed to be done to get our kids uh, from our churches uh, to have a place uh, that's safe and pleasant, uh, a, a nice Christian camp experience. Experience. And, and so we're going at this for hour after hour. We're probably four hours into it and, and, and we're tired just loading this chipper all day long. And there's this, you, you know, young guy sitting over in a lounge chair under a shade tree asking people to bring him, you know, drinks and sodas and lemonades. And, and then all of us who are working, he's barking orders at us. Hey, you're not doing that right. Hey, you need to put that over there. Hey, you need to do this. And I haven't seen the, the guy move once. And I was new to all of this. I didn't know very many people there. It was a new place. I had just taken a new pastorate in this, this place, in this denomination. And so I, I asked the person who I was working with, I said, you know, uh, who, who is that guy over there with the, the, the tall glass of lemonade who's sitting, you know, under the shade? You, you know, what, what's he doing over there? And uh, I, I haven't seen him do anything. And, uh, you know, the, the person next to me said, oh, yeah, he's, he's the pastor of such and such church. You know, he's not an older individual. He's somebody who was younger than me even at that time. And so uh, at one point, we're taking a break. And I sat in his, you know, general area. And he, and, and he came over and he sort of just said, hey, what's your name? And I said, uh, you know, my, my name is Chad Williams. And he paused for a minute. And he kind of, his eyes got a little bit big. And he said, wait, are you the new pastor at such and such a church? It was probably the best known church in, in, in the state of California and the, uh, the most recognized uh, church in that state. And, and, and so, uh, you know, he, he had heard my name and he said, oh, wait, and, and, and you also, you're, you're the new professor, doc, Dr. Williams at our college, right? Is that, is that you? I said, yep, yep, that's me teaching our future pastors. <laughs> And I wanted to say, I'm the one who you've been barking at orders all day and sitting and drinking your lemonade while you sat in your chair under the, the shade chair or the, the, the shade tree. But I didn't. <laughs> uh, and so he just looked at me and he kind of smiled and walked away, didn't say much. But his eyes were kind of taken aback by that. And it was interesting that immediately following that encounter, he got up out of his chair and moved around a little bit and he started throwing things in the wood chipper. And the guy that was working next to me, he looked over and he had heard the whole conversation and he saw him going to work and he said, I think you just guilted him to work, didn't you? I said, I don't know, but I'm glad he's finally out of his chair. But as I was thinking about this situation, I thought, well, you know, that's not so unusual. I shouldn't, that, that shouldn't be surprising for me because he has the mentality that many people have in the body of Christ. It's really not that different from a, a, a large <laughs> kind of a, a segment of the church. Serve me. Let me tell you what to do. Let me tell you how to do it while I enjoy the benefit of your labor. In fact, it's been said that there's a, such a thing as a 2080 rule that has existed in the church forever. 20% actively serve, well, 80% actively receive. I don't know how true that is. I, I, I don't know if that statistics or not. I like to think that the serving percentage is higher. And generally, I, 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 I certainly believe that it's higher at Union Church of Manila than a 2080. However, the point in all of this is that we need to embrace one another activity when it comes to the people around us, that there should be one another movement, that we should all be in this mindset where we are serving one another and we have this, where we are exhibiting one another activity in the body of Christ as I serve the members of the body of Christ. So, so second thing, when it comes to us as UCMers, 
if we're going to be united in Christ, number two, jot it down. We need to be marked by one another activity. We need to be marked by one another activity. And if we value unity, if we value one another, we will, it will be shown, it will be manifested in our activity. We will serve one another. We'll labor for one another. We are active in our commitment to one another. It will be tangibly witnessed around us as we strive to be a place where we are demonstrating great love through our actions. Well, we've looked at this idea of having a one another attitude. We've had a one another activity, but the Bible also gives us a third category. I think that's clear as we look through the one another language. It, 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 it's the one another words that we use. The, the one another, how we use our mouths for the sake of others. In fact, look at some of them that are in the scripture with me. Things like encourage one another, admonish one another, don't slander one another, instruct one another, don't grumble against each other, confess your sins to each other, pray for each other. See, these one another texts here seem to indicate that when we open our mouths in the presence of others in the body of Christ, it should be for their benefit, their encouragement, for building them up. That the mouth that God has given us is to be used frequently in the body of Christ to bring unity in the body of Christ and for the good of others. And the question that we should ask is, do my words align with this? Do my words go out with otherness in mind for the sake of, of building them up? Does my language exhibit a lot of this? See, my problem, and I'll confess to you openly, is that many times when I speak or post online or a pine or wax eloquence, <laughs> you know, I'm not thinking about the other person that I'm speaking with. I'm not thinking about what's really best for them. I'm speaking to win my argument. I'm speaking to share my knowledge so that I can be heard. I, I, I'm promoting myself. I'm promoting my ideas and my preferences. See, much of our language is not one another driven. And that's something we have to learn as we follow Christ, that the Lord would shape our language to become one another people who are speaking with one another words. So often we're driven by our own purposes, which uh, we'll never fully consider, considering the, uh, are caring deeply about the person in front of us and how we use our language. There's a fictional story, I'm sure, it's a, of the homeless man who was uh, going through a picturesque sort of English village, and he, he was uh, hungry to the point of almost fainting when he stopped by a pub, and he looked and he saw the sign out the front side of the pub, and it said, the inn of St. George and the Dragon. And so he thought, well, maybe I could get some relief here, and he knocked on the kitchen door of the pub, and a lady answered the door and said, and he said to her, you know, please, ma'am, could you, could you spare me something to eat? I'm so hungry. She yelled back at him with the most venomous words she could come up with. And she said, why would I give you a sorry, smelly, stinking rat beggar a bite to eat? Get out of here now. With just all kinds of venom coming out of it. And she slammed the door in his face. And the man began to leave downhearted when he looked up at the sign again. And it said, St. George and the Dragon. And so he turned around and went back and knocked at the door. And again, the same lady opened the door and she he was surprised to see him again. And she yelled, now what do you want? I thought I made myself clear. Get out of here. And he said, well, ma'am, uh, can I speak with St. George this time? <laughs> now, I know that illustration, of course, is hyperbole and, you, you know, given to give us a little bit of a chuckle. But... We can often use language that drives other people away and divides rather than welcomes, rather than builds, rather than unifies. I know too often in my life I have used dragon-like words, even in the body of Christ. And to be honest with you, for years I've struggled with dragon words. I still do. <laughs> 
You, you know, growing up, you know, this goes all the way back to my youth. Growing up, I was sarcastic. I was rude. And sometimes I was downright mean. And I loved to taunt my sister with the sharpest and wittiest of tongue. And I remember one day after bringing my older sister to tears, you know, as a teenager, I, I was without excuse at this point. I just loved to harass her. And my mother came to me with exhaustion in her voice. And she said, you know, Chad, not only are you deeply wounding your sister by the things you say, you're tearing our family apart. Who? My mother's keen observation was true. Words were venomous, and venomous words are destructive, as they are not one another centered. And when our words don't consider others, they slide into a very dangerous and destructive place. And James reminds us, even in the book of James, he writes this little letter and, and he reminds the church of Jerusalem that our words or our tongues are like a spark. And that word goes out and then it burns the whole forest down. But the flip side that the Bible is trying to teach us about is if you have one another language, it builds, it gives life, it gives encouragement, it provides refreshment to others in the body of Christ. And we unify, I'm thinking of our, our grief share team that we have, how they build each other up each week as, as people come in with broken hearts and, and they come out of tragedy and, and, and terrible experiences. And as they use these words and, and communicate with each other, just on a Zoom class and a Zoom format, th th there's these strong relationships Relationships that are being built because the idea is to encourage and build each other through these dark moments in life. And therefore, there's tremendous love and unity that is being established. See, if we value unity, we need to be marked by one another language. How are you doing there? As you look at the, uh, the different characteristics of one another language. Number three, last thing on your outline, jot it down. We at UCM. We need to be known by our one another language. We need to be known by our one another language. Listen, I'm not sure what kind of one another life that you are living for the body of Christ. But are, 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 do you have one another attitudes or one another actions and one another words? Because those are critical to the unity of the church. And I wonder if you would be willing to pray that God would help transform you to be a one another person. The wonderful thing is UCM is full of them already. I have the joy of meeting with them all the time and seeing them in action. But 59 times we're reminded, beloved, to grow in otherness. Whether we're new believers or lifelong believers, we can all grow if we take these 59 examples and we put them in front of us and we, we pray through that and we say, Lord, make me like that. James Bryan Smith, we, our ministry team is going through a book with him called The Good and Faithful, uh, The Good and Beautiful God. And he said this in one of his chapters, he says, the modern ethos of narcissism is pervasive in our culture and prevalent in our churches. Think about that. The modern ethos of narcissism is pervasive in our culture and prevalent in our churches. This idea of me being driven by me. In other words, the way of life that, that is absent all around us is this one another way of life because we've been so focused on narcissism and me. And sadly, sometimes that mentality creeps into the church. And consequently, there's a false narrative that exists in the body of Christ that the church exists to serve me. The church exists to encourage me. The church exists to cater to my preferences and, and my needs and my wants. Yeah, sometimes it does. I'll, I'll give you that. And it should. But Christ came with this movement in his body and in his mission that was completely driven by otherness. He said it clearly when he came, it said, I came to serve, not to be served. 
that is his body. That's his heart. And he showed us a pure and true one another mindset. One quick reflection here. I, I used to have a picture with a story in it in my office. It hung on my wall for years that I needed as a reminder as I tried to meet the demands of serving people as a pastor and just as a, as, as a person who's trying to serve the Lord. It's now in a box in storage somewhere. But it's a quote from that old story, The Velveteen Rabbit. I don't, I don't know if you know that nursery rhyme, that nursery story. Uh, I've read it growing up and it, there is a part of it that has stuck with me through the year. The quote comes, when, when the nursery stuffed animal, who is the rabbit, he's seeking advice of an old, worn out, much used, loved, stuffed horse that was in the nursery. And, and this is what was on my wall. It said, the skin horse had lived longer in the nursery than any of the others. He was so old that his brown coat was bald and in patches, and he showed the seams underneath, and most of the hairs on his tail had been pulled out to string bead necklaces. He was wise, for he had seen a long succession of mechanical toys arrive to boast and swagger, and one by one break their main streams and pass, main springs and pass away. And he knew they were only toys, and would never return into anything else. For nursery magic is very strange and wonderful, and only those playthings that are old and wise and experienced, like the skin horse, understand all about that. What is real? Asked the velveteen rabbit one day when they were lying side by side near the nursery fender before Nana came in to tidy the room. Does it mean having things inside you that buzz or, or a stick handle? Skin horse said, no, real isn't how you are made. It's, it's the thing that happens in you when a child really loves you and for a long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt? Asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the kiss again horse, for he was always truthful. When you're real, you don't mind being hurt though. Does it happen all at once or bit by bit? Uh, uh, like being wound up or little by little? It doesn't happen all at once. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily, have sharp edges, or need to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you're real, most of your hair has been loved off, your eyes drop out, and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all. Because once you're real, you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. You say, Chad, that, that's an odd thing to place on your wall. I guess it is. But I hung it on my office because I wanted to be like that old horse that loved so well and was used so well. I saw Christ's example in that story. So my prayer was, Lord, I don't need to be shiny or polished or have lots of gears that will catch people's attention and certainly don't make me sharp or carefully kept. But let me be so other-minded that I wear out, that I fully expend myself for your people, that there would be anotherness about me as I strive to live and rub up against other people. I, I want to be like Paul when he said to the Corinthian church in chapter 12, he, he said it this way, he said, I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Totally concerned about the soul in front of them. Totally wrapped up and, and spending himself for out of service to the body of Christ. That is one anotherness in its fullest form. Oh, that the church would be transformed to overflowing with these kind of people. Having his attitude, having his activity, having his words as we offer ourselves sacrificially in a one another lifestyle. And as we walk together in this way of life, we will find ourselves united in Christ. Let's read it one more time. We are an international community from diverse backgrounds, cultures, and denominations bound together by our common commitment to exalt the person and work of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that it would be so. Let us be one another people. May the people of Makati and Manila and the Philippines and the world know that UCM 
is full of people that have one another actions, attitudes, and words. Let us be a city on a hill, a light in the darkness, as we shine forth your glory in the body of Christ. Amen. Uncharted, my soul will embark. I'll follow your voice straight into the dark. And if from the course you intend I depart, Speak to the sails of my wandering heart Like the wind you'll guide Clear the skies before me And I'll glide this old Stars, your word will align my voice and remind me where I've been and where I am going. In the shallows amidst fear and fog The truth is the compass that points me back north Jesus, my captain, my soul's trusted Lord Rightfully yours Like the wind You'll guide Clear the skies Before me And I'll glide This open sea Like the stars My captain, my soul's trusted Lord All my allegiance is right
rightful be yours. And so now as our gathering ends, so our service begins. The congregation says, we will go. We will share the good news and take the light of Christ into the darkness. Go then, you are sent. Now let us receive our benediction. Brothers and sisters, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace with one another. And the Lord of love and peace will be with you. Amen and amen. amen. Have a great week. Amen.